This video is intended to be a quick review for students who have already taken Algebra 2 Pre-Calculus and is just a fast review over the four different ways that you can represent a function. You should remember that representing functions can be done verbally, whether that's the spoken word or the written word, numerically, where you use numbers such as an input-output table or just uh, some trial and error, just playing with the numbers to see, visually, which would be a graph, and algebraically, which is an explicit equation like y equals 2x plus 1 for a very simple equation. Besides being able to represent functions as a learning objective, you should also be able to analyze functions to determine some important characteristics or properties, some of which we will discuss in this video. Take a look at the vocabulary. Each of these should be a little bit familiar. Function, domain, range, independent, dependent variables, odd and even functions, absolute value, step functions, arrow diagrams, increasing and decreasing. They're all things that you would have, are likely to have seen in previous classes. We'll, we will use them without taking the time to define them because you should already be familiar with them. Starting off, example one. Find the values of f of 1 and f of negative 2. Okay, remember what f of 1 means. That means you plug in x equals 1 and you get out what y value. Well, fairly straightforward. We can go to x equals 1, come straight up until it intersects the graph, comes over. That is a height of 2, so we get f of 1 equals 2. Same process for f of negative 2. If we go to an x value of negative 2 and go up until we intersect the graph, we would have to say, what height is that? It doesn't look like a question mark, but that's what it was intended to be. Well, do we know it with perfection? No, but we should be able to look at it and say 1, 2, 3, about 3.5. So there we go. Part B asks the question, what is, what are the domain and the range? Okay, so determine the domain. Remember, the domain are any x value that you can plug in and actually get something that makes sense. Understanding that this behavior goes and continues, is there anywhere that you have a hole, a gap, or just x values that you won't be able to get? Not on this one. For this problem, we get all of the x-axis, which you may have seen this symbol for all real numbers. When we consider the range, we have to think, what are the y values, the up and down values? Well, because of the arrow on the left, we know it's going to continue going down forever. That will get us all of the negatives. And because of our arrow on the right, we know it's going to continue going upward forever. So once again, this is one that we get all the real numbers for the range. Continuing with example two, sketch the graph to be able to find the domain and range. Okay, so starting off with part A, we have f of x equals 3x minus 2. Well, remembering that this is slope-intercept form with mx uh, plus b, that would tell us we have the y-intercept and the slope 3 over 1, so we can go just y-intercept of 2, and then up 3, right 1, up 3, right 1, up 3, right 1, down 3, left 1, down 3, left 1. And we can do enough to get a sketch. And once again, we would have to ask ourselves, because the directions ask, what is the domain, what is the range? 
for this particular one, we get all the x values, we get all the y values, so we again have domain and range as all real numbers. Switching to red for problem B, we would have g of x <laughs> equals x squared. So we'd have 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared would be 9, negative 1 squared, negative 2 squared, negative 3 squared. And so when we create the graph, you probably remember x squared creates a parabola. So what are the domain? What are the range values? The domain values and the range values. So I'm going to switch to yellow for this one. To ask for the domain, we're saying, what are the x values that we're getting along here? Is there anywhere along the x-axis that you would be able to draw straight up or straight down and not get a point? For example, if I went over here to negative 6 and drew straight up, will the graph eventually cross that vertical line? Yeah, because of the arrow, we know it's going to keep going over. And it may take a while, but yeah, eventually it will cross over. So we'd get all the negatives. Same issues going on on the right. Eventually it will get over. So that tells us our domain is all the reals. And I'm going to back that up and write the answer in red. For the range, we are saying the same piece. Is there anywhere on the y-axis that we could go left and right and not get 1? Well, for example, 5, I can go left or right, and we're intersecting the graph, so that's part of the range. If you go 7 left and right, you can intersect and get part of the range. But you probably note at the bottom that horizontal line is never going to intersect our parabola. Because they don't cross, there is no y value on the graph that gets down that low. That's an indicator that we don't have the entire set of real numbers. We have everything from 0 and up. Well, please <coughs> remember, is this supposed to be a curved parenthesis, an open parenthesis, or the closed bracket? Probably saying it's got to be closed, and you're right. It is closed because we use the square bracket to indicate, yes, this actually is included. We'll continue to our next example. If f of x equals 2x squared plus 4x plus 2, and h is not equal to 0, evaluate f of a plus h, subtract f of a all over h. This is something that should look very, very familiar for students who have taken pre-calculus. You probably remember it by its name. This is called the difference quotient. A difference quotient because subtraction means difference and quotient because you're doing division. Incredibly important piece in calculus. Uh, when you are working with the next unit, when you're working with derivatives, this is an incredibly important component. Don't want to get into it too much right now, but please note, this isn't just a small thing that we're saying, oh, don't worry about it. Okay, so let's start off. We need to do f of a plus h. Well, we'll use a plus h to replace every single x, so 2 a plus h, replacing the x, plus 4, a plus h, replacing the x, plus 2. And let's start expanding all this. a plus h is a squared plus 2ah plus h squared. Using the distributive property, then, on both sets of parentheses, we could expand it by getting 2a squared plus 2ah plus 2h squared plus 4a plus 4h plus 2. 
And all of that piece in the red was just to get this one little part there. Putting them together, the difference quotient would be f of a plus h plus 4a plus 4h plus 2. And then we are going to subtract f of a. Well, remember when you're subtracting across f of a to a squared plus 4a plus 2? Don't forget that you have to subtract each individual piece. It's subtract 2a squared and subtract 4a and subtract 2, positive 2. And all of that is over h. Well, from this point, we can start finding pieces that will cancel. 2a squared subtract 2a squared is 0. Plus 2 minus 2 plus 4a minus 4a. And when all of those pieces cancel, we are left with 2ah plus 2h squared plus 4h all over an h. In the numerator, we could factor out the h, or 1h, from each of the terms in the numerator with the distributive property, which is rather nice because that will then allow us to cancel h's and leaves us with our final answer that we actually want, 2a plus 2h plus 4. This is the difference quotient. This type of problem is one that you will need to do several times when we are working with derivatives. This is intended to be a quick review. Example 4. When you turn on a hot water faucet, the temperature, capital T, of the water depends on how long, that's a typo, it says ling, but it's supposed to be long, how long the water, the water has been running. Draw a rough graph of capital T as a function of the time lowercase t that has elapsed since the faucet was turned on. Okay, so we're looking at, oh, didn't want that. I need this. Okay, so we'll, come on. This, oh, I was on the wrong setting. That's why. Got it. Okay, so here we go. We have capital T, which will be the time in, let's say, minutes. I got that wrong. Capital T is the temperature, which could be in, say, degrees Fahrenheit. Then we'd have lowercase t, which could be in minutes. Well, you notice how we don't actually, we're not actually told what the pieces are. I'm making an assumption that we're basing this on minutes. I'm making the assumption that this is based on degrees Fahrenheit. But since we are not specifically told them, and also since we are doing a sketch, we don't need the precision for these pieces because we don't know if it actually is Celsius. We don't know. We don't know time for minutes. We don't know temperature. So we're not going to actually have the numbers on here because we don't know. When we're drawing a rough graph, all that we need to do is keep in mind what's actually happening. Well, when you turn on your hot water faucet, typically it's going to take a little bit of time to get to a very hot temperature, but not very long. And then you have a period where you get to maintain your hot water. But after a while, you run out of hot water, so it's going to start getting a little bit colder. But it doesn't get cold really, really, really fast, or at least it shouldn't going to get down to a point where the temperature kind of bottoms out and then it just runs. You'll notice when I started this graph, how I started down here, this is indicating that we probably started with a temperature of water at zero. Well, depending on if we were doing Celsius or Fahrenheit, obviously if it's Fahrenheit, that's below freezing. And for Celsius, it's at freezing, 
you don't generally have freezing water coming out of the hose so starting it off down here is actually a problem because the water is not really that cold it should have been connected somewhere so that we had a y intercept or a capital t intercept above this line of zero and you'll note if we came straight across that's about where they are it returns to the y-intercept, which is like the natural cold water. And there we go. We have a quick sketch. Based on just thinking through the situation, we were able to create a visual graph of what's going on. Example 5. A rectangular storage container with an open top has a volume of 8 cubic meters. The length of the base is half the width. Material for the base costs $6 per square meter. Materials for the sides cost $4 per square meter. Express the cost of the materials as a function for the width of the base. Okay, so there are several different components <coughs> going on here. We will need to piece them together. First of all, it's a rectangular storage container, which tells us this is a rectangular prism. The volume for a rectangular prism is length times width times height. The second component says the length of the base is half the width. So this piece is telling us length is half width. So we can replace this lowercase l in the volume formula, this becomes half of width. Okay. We also have then this relationship for the material. The cost of the material is going to be the bottom plus the four sides. You'll note I don't have a top listed because we are told it's an open top. So there is no top sheet that will fill it in. Well, if we want the cost then, it's going to be $6 per square meter. That will be the area for the base. And then $4 for the area of the sides. piecing these things together. Keep in mind what the bottom will look like. This is similar to what our bottom would be. We have the width. I've got that backwards. This is the width. This is the length, which is half the width. So, to get this area for the base, we just have length times width, which is half the width times the other width. This is a piece that will give us the cost for just the bottom. But we also have the four sides. Come on. I can't get a hold of my uh, rectangle here. There we go. So when we start building this we're noting the four sides would connect and create a box like this. Now please note the shape that we have. When we are considering the sides, we have the right hand side, which is a rectangle where we have half the width and then the height of the prism. But that's the same piece that's over on the left. So, when we're building this, we would have the area for the sides is going to be two of the rectangles for half width times h. This is the piece that will give us the area for the left-hand side and also the right-hand side. Besides having the left and the right, 
we also have the front side and the back side, which is another rectangle. This time, it's height and width for the front. We can see that by catching this area here. It's tracing it out there, width and height. So we would then have the front and back, two of them, with width times height. And this piece that we have in blue now creates an equation for the total cost. But please note that total cost has two variables in it. It has the width and it has the height. We were asked for this with width only. We can't keep the height. Well, what we'll need to do is to create an equation that will allow us to substitute in for that h. In particular, we knew that the volume was 8. So the volume formula is this. Well, we can take times 2 to cancel, which would give us 16 equals w squared times h. Dividing by w squared would allow us to isolate the equation. 16 over w squared. That's the height. We can now take this component and substitute it into this blue equation on the right, which would give us 6 times half w squared plus 4. 2 times half would be 1, w, h, but h is 16 over w squared, plus 2, w, h, so 16 over w squared, and we now have an equation that gives us what we want the cost in terms of only the width. Still needs to be simplified, though. Half of 6 is 3. Inside the parentheses, we'd have w times 16 over w squared would be 16 over w. Similarly, on the right, we'd have 32 over w. And when we factor that across, we'd have 30 or 3w squared plus 4, 48 over w, which we could then use the distributive property on or just multiply. Uh, 48 times 4, 160 plus 32 is 192 over w. And we are finally done. Here's an equation for the total cost based on the width of the box. Yes, it's a lot of work. Yes, it's a lot of algebra. The basic idea behind the problem, though, was fairly straightforward. The structure behind this problem was to do two pieces. First, create an equation based on the volume. Second, create an equation for the piece that you actually want. Create an equation for the cost of the materials. When you create the cost of the materials equation, you will have to use multiple variables. But we only want one variable. That's where this piece comes in. <laughs> you will be able to solve the equation for the volume or whichever, however the problem comes out. Maybe it's surface area, maybe it's a perimeter problem, maybe it's an area problem, but you'll be able to solve it to isolate the variable that you can then substitute into the other equation. You remember back when you were doing Algebra 1 how you had to 
do equations like x plus y equals 10 and y equals x plus 2? Do you remember solving equations like this where you just said, well, this y variable I can plug in and replace to create a different equation to solve? That's what we just did. This substitution process that you were doing back in Algebra 1 is what we did for this big problem. It's just that we had much, much, much more complicated equations to work with. The same idea for substitution, just tougher equations with tougher algebra. Example 6, we're going back to domain. Typically, domain is easier to figure out based on the restrictions. Remember, if you are trying to determine the domain, getting a list of everything that works is actually pretty difficult. <coughs> it's easier to find things that don't work. And when you're working with reals, there are three things that you have to be careful about. Taking a logarithm of a non-negative, or I'm sorry, a non-positive. I said that backwards. If you take a logarithm of a non-positive, so you cannot take logarithms of negative numbers, you cannot take logarithms of zero. If you do, or if you're forced to, that's a problem that will create a restriction on the domain. Secondly, we know that you can't take the square roots of negative numbers. Now, based on your earlier classes, you know about the number i, you know that you actually can take the square roots of negatives, but then you are forced to work with complex numbers. Fortunately, in calculus, we will never do anything with complex numbers in this entire class. There are future calculus classes where you, do cal where you will do calculus with complex numbers, but that's not the purpose of this class. Not yet. That's a couple of you classes down the road. So for our purposes, taking the square root of a negative is still a big problem. And the third one, we know that you can't divide by zero. So let's just check those restrictions. For problem A, there is no logarithm, so no problem there. There is no division, so you don't have to worry about dividing by zero. The only issue is a square root or more generally, an even-powered root. And we have that. We, in order for this to work, we must have our radicand be greater than or equal to zero, because it can't be negative. That's a simple inequality to solve. You add four to both sides, you get x is greater than or equal to four. So the domain, we know, <laughs> excuse me, the domain is everything from 4 on up. Problem B is similar. Looking for the domain, there are no logarithms, so no problems there. We do not have a, a square root, so no problems there. But the quotient that we can see, 1 over, is division. So we have a problem when x squared plus x equals 0. If x squared plus x equals 0, that's going to tell us we're dividing by 0, and we know we can't do that. So to correct this, we can factor out an x, which gives us x times x plus 1 equals 0. And by the 0 product property, we know x equals 0 or x equals negative 1. Those are pieces that will cause problems for us. Those are the things that don't work. So we can write up our answer then using interval notation with interval with the union symbol. The domain is everything from negative infinity up to negative 1, unioned with everything from negative 1 to 0, unioned with everything from 0 to positive infinity. And that works. That is interval notation. If you took pre-calculus, you probably would remember set builder notation. This is my preference, and it's one that you'll use some in calculus, 
some with interval notation, it's helpful to know both. But frankly, <coughs> the domain are all the x's that are it, are an element of the reals. Such that x is not 0 and not negative 1. That is my preferred method. If you hadn't taken pre-calculus before, the most common question that people ask is, what is that symbol? It kind of looks like an E, and it means is an element of. Basically, x is a real number. That's all that this piece is saying. Continuing with example 7. A function is f of x. This time we have a piecewise defined function. Remember, a piecewise defined function has the multiple different levels and conditions. Whenever we have x is less than or equal to 1, you use the top equation. But if x is greater than 1, you use the bottom equation. So, to start off, evaluate f of 0. Okay, f of 0 is here. 0 is less than 1. That tells us we have to use the top equation. 4 subtract 0 is 4. We were also told to evaluate f of 3. But 3 belongs here. 3 is greater than 1. Because it meets the condition on the right, we have to use the bottom equation. 3 squared is 9. And so we were able to complete those two pieces, f of 0 and f of 3. But lastly, we need to sketch the graph. So please note, 4 subtract x is a line. We should be able to recognize this as negative 1x plus 4. Again, we have slope-intercept forms, so with a y-intercept of 4 and a slope of negative 1, we can create the line. I'm putting the closed-in dot because it's or equal to. From here, we now need to attach the second part for greater than. Well, 1 squared would be a 1, which fits right here. Please notice I'm using the open circle because it is not a part of it. Plugging in 2, 2 squared would be 4, 3 squared would be 9. Well, that's, 9 would actually be a little bit higher. And so we're filling it in. There's our graph. A piecewise defined function that has a whole well, not just a hole, but this is a gap where it jumps from one function to another. Example 8. Sketch the absolute value function. Well, remember what the absolute value function actually is. Those vertical lines mean a piecewise defined function where you take x, if you have 0 or positive, but you take the opposite of x, if it's less than 0. So basically, if it's positive, you keep it positive, and if it's negative, switch the sign to make it positive. Well, that would give us 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, or 5, 5, 6, 6, 6, 7, 7. It's just a line, y equals x. But where we would have the, normally the line y equals x continuing downward, all of these, though, are negatives below the x-axis. Well, we have to flip it and bring them back up a positive, taking their opposites. So there is our graph of y of the function f of x equals absolute value of x. This is a piece that's good, worth having memorized, how it kind of forms the v shape. People typically remember parabolas, but you should also remember absolute value forms the sharp corner V. Example 9. Create a formula for this function. Well, you notice the sharp corner V that we have? This looks like an absolute value function. 
Now, instead of being based at the origin, it's been moved over. Well, this problem is basically just saying, how do you do a translation on functions? So that would tell us, normally, we'd have absolute value of x. What got done to it, though? All right, so it was shifted two units to the right. To shift to the right, you actually use the opposite symbol inside the absolute value, inside the function, inside the argument. But then it also needs to get shifted down one. But changes on the y-axis go outside. So down one, we're done. It's just saying, do you remember how to do those kinds of shifts for a translation of a base function? Example 10, write a formula for the step function shown. Okay, you notice how each time we have a different gap? Each one of these pieces, each one of these lines for the step function are going to be a different line on a piecewise. And remember, it's called a step function because if you were allowed to go and connect the vertical, it basically looks like a set of steps. Okay, so our step function, we're going to start off. f of x equals, and I'm going to start off with the big one. I'm going to get the conditions first. If we have, you notice how all the way over here, it's actually filled in. Because it's filled in, that, oh, let me try to phrase this. It looks like it's filled in, but it, it also looks like it's filled in here. They aren't. These are indicated to be open circles on the left with the red. Because it's difficult to see, that's why they changed the color. Each one of these is supposed to be an open circle in the red for the left, a closed circle on the right. Because of that, and also based on the idea, if you have no earning, should you have to pay tax? No. We would start off by saying there is zero tax if the taxable amount is actually equal to zero. From there, we have windows that say from zero up to and including 0.2. It continues from 0.2 up to 0.4 from point four. Oh, that one should not have had the line. Up to point six. From point six up to and including point eight. And from point eight up to one. Point oh. Well, now we just gotta get our equations. The height there, 0.01. Second one has a height, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. And we're done. Yay, yay, we're happy. We have the step function. Remember, step functions are called step functions because the x pieces or the y values are evenly spaced, generally. 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. Each one of those is constant. We didn't have an x going on there because each one was a horizontal line or a horizontal line segment. Example 11, are the functions even odd or neither. Okay, so big things worth remembering. An even function has the definition that if you take and replace 
the argument with opposite of x, and then you simplify it, you get the same thing. And an odd function is if you replace it with the negative, you wind up with negative f of x. Those were the algebraic characteristics, the, the algebraic characterization of a function, of an even or odd. If you were to use a graphing calculator, you would re should remember that an even has y-axis symmetry. You can flip it left and right, and it'll look the same. An odd function has uh, rotational symmetry. Uh, it's also called origin symmetry. Spin the graph around the origin 180 degrees. Basically, you turn it upside down. Does it look the same? If it does, when you spin it, it's an odd function. But if the graph has neither of those types of symmetry, then it is neither. Fortunately, each one of these problems are polynomials. Polynomials have a really nice shortcut. Just look at the exponents. 4 and 2 are both even. Because every exponent is even, it's an even function. When we look at part B, check the exponents. We see 3, which would lead a lot of people to say it's odd. But there is a very, very common mistake here that you have to be careful about. This is a plain x. Whenever you have a const, I'm sorry, a plain 1, there's no x written. When that happens, when you have a constant like that, this is understood to be 1 times x to the 0, because we know x to the 0 is 1. Well, when we're looking at it this way, consider the exponents. 3 is odd, but 0 is even. We have a combination of odd and even exponents, and because it's a combination, that's actually the clue that this is neither. For part C, we can look at them and say, well, since we don't see an exponent, it's understood to be x to the first. And so 1 and 2, even and odd, this is another instance where it's neither. If you had a polynomial that would check out to be odd, we'll say example d could be something like x to the fifth minus 2x to the third. This would be an odd function because exponent of 5, exponent of 3. Both of those are odd numbers, so it's an odd function. And the coefficient of 2 doesn't matter at all. Coefficients do not have an effect on odd or even. This shortcut that I pointed out only works for polynomials. If you have a rational function that is built like 2x x to the fifth minus 2x cubed over x squared. You see how we have 5, 3, and 2? This does not ne mean that it's neither. It does not mean that it's odd. It does not mean that it's even. When you have rational functions or other functions like a trig function, you actually do need to go back and use the piece that we had in red. Use the criteria. Or if you have a graphing calculator, you can type it into the graphing calculator so you get it represented visually. And then visually, you can check to see which kind of symmetry it has, if it has symmetry at all. Last example of what we have. Where is this function increasing or decreasing? Well, you have to remember what increasing means. It's going up decreasing, and I misspelled that. This is not supposed to have an E right there. Decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. It basically means the function is going down. 
a very nice way of imagining it is start off on the left hand side and I've got my little dude who's walking around. Is the little dude walking as he's going to the right? Is he walking uphill or downhill? If it's going uphill, you've got increasing. If it's going downhill, you have decreasing. So follow it out. Uphill, 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 until there. We can drop straight down and say, there we go. This interval, I should switch the colors. This interval is increasing because it's going up. From there, we'll continue. Downhill, 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 until there. So we can come straight up. And now say this interval, this whole piece where it was downhill, that is decreasing. Well, now we've switched. Uphill, 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 uphill. This one is back to being an increasing interval. If we assume that the graph keeps going forever, we could say that we'd have negative infinity, so on and so forth. But for this particular problem, I'm not going to assume that they go on forever. I'm making the assumption that they stop right where the graphs end. Well, if we make that assumption, then our intervals where it is increasing are right here. From negative 7 to negative 4, and then from 3 to 6. Please notice on all of them I use the open parentheses. I use the open parentheses because intervals of increasing and decreasing never, ever, ever include the endpoints. Frankly, when you're right at the top of the hill, are you going up or down when you're at the perfect peak? Well, really, it's neither one. And when you're all the way down at the bottom of this little valley, are you walking up or down? Well, for a brief moment at the perfect uh, bottom, you, it's neither one. That's why we use the open parentheses instead of the closed brackets. Finishing this problem off, intervals where it's decreasing are from negative 4 to negative 3. So negative 4 to positive 3. I don't know why I said negative 3. And there we go. We have our intervals of increasing or decreasing. So with those 12 examples, we spent a lot of time going through and looking at these learning objectives. Represent functions verbally, numerically, visually, and algebraically. Verbally is with words, whether spoken word or written word. Numerically, you would use numbers. Visually is a graph. Algebraically is an explicit equation. In a lot of instances, if you are given a function in one form, you can get more information by converting it to a different format. That's where the analyzing functions learning objective takes its role. Some remind you of some of these pieces. Right here, this is numerical. We're using numbers to get information about the graph. Domain and range, we used the visual graph to create or to discover some characteristics. In this one, we started off algebraically, where we had a specific equation, but we turned it into visual with a graph. Here, this was done completely algebraic, algebraically. Here, we had a verbal model which we turned into a graphical model. And we could keep running through these pieces, a verbal model to an algebraic model. An algebraic model into more algebra, but it's discovering characteristics. 
algebraic and visual, algebraic and visual, algebraic and visual, algebraic and visual, algebraic and in this case, um, I don't know if we would really call this numerical. I would, yeah, this is more algebra and algebra, algebraic and visual. In a lot of these instances, we're going back and forth trying to get information based on the different ways that we can represent them. We need to be able to represent functions, which will allow us to do, which will allow us to analyze them.